long of a sense of Solomon. Unless the Lord builds the house, the, the builders labor in vain. Unless the Lord watches over the city, the guards stand watch in vain. In vain you rise early and stay up late, toiling for food to eat. For he grants sleep to those he loves. Children are the heritage from the Lord, offspring a reward from him. Like arrows in the hands of a warrior are children born in one's youth. Blessed is the man whose quiver is full of them. They will not be put to shame when they contend with their opponents in court. The word of the Lord. Would you pray with me? Father God, we come to you this morning um, because you have the words of life, because you are truth, because the claims you make are definitive, because you give us hope, you give us life, you are, uh, you give purpose, Lord, to uh, what would otherwise be a purposeless existence. Help us, Lord, to find our rest in you. As we look through Psalm 127 this morning and, and uh, consider, Lord, the work of our hands, we ask, Lord, that you would help us to view it rightly. We ask, Lord, that you would help us to uh, surrender to you, Lord, more and more, um, to see, Lord, your way and, and uh, what that is for us. Pray, Lord, that, that where conviction needs to happen, Lord, that we would be convicted this morning. Where encouragement need, is needed, Lord, would you encourage our hearts? We, we come to you, Lord, because we know that you, are always, you always do what's right. And we know, Lord, that the word that you have for us this morning is good. And so we fall at your feet, pleading, Lord, for you to meet us here. In your name we pray. Amen. Well, good morning, church. It's wonderful to be here with you today. Uh, Chantal and I spent the tail end of this last week in uh, Frisco, Colorado at a pastor's retreat, and it was wonderful. Uh, it was absolutely gorgeous, but as you know, life is all about the people, and uh, we just had a wonderful time catching up with our pastor friends and their wives, and, uh, but it's great to be here with you this morning. Uh, 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17 tells us that all scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. I think that we're still allowed some favorites. I hope that's okay. Uh, books and passages that, that communicate something profound or life-changing for us. Books that, that struck us maybe at an important uh, transitional time in our life. Stories that help us make sense of our world. The books of Job and Ecclesiastes have been these sorts of books for me. Uh, the book of Job tells us about a man who, relative to all other people living on this planet at that time, was living an upright and God-honoring life, and yet everything was taken from him. His children, his possessions, his health. We see that, that extreme end of the human experience. Job is humbled and gains a new paradigm, a new way of seeing and understanding God and himself in relation to this new understanding. A man who has everything loses it all and find God's, finds God in the end. And in the book of Ecclesiastes, a man is described for us on the other end of the human extreme. Kohalet, which in Hebrew means the teacher. Solomon, the king of Israel. A man who denied himself no pleasure. Ecclesiastes describes a man who wanted for nothing. If he wanted something, he bought it. If he saw beauty, he took it. He undertook great projects, chapter 2 tells us, building homes and planting vineyards. He made gardens and parks and planted every fruit tree available in the ancient world. He made great reservoirs of water and planted groves of trees. He owned more herds and flocks than anyone in Israel. He amassed for himself silver and gold, male and female slay, uh, singers, and a, a harem of women. And the author tells us, after all of this accumulation, all of his toil, all of his success, Ecclesiastes 2, 10 and 11, 
I denied myself nothing my eyes desired. I refused my heart no pleasure. My heart took delight in all of my labor, and this was the reward for all of my toil. Yet when I surveyed all that my hands had done and what I had toiled to achieve, everything was meaningless, a chasing after the wind. Nothing was gained under the sun. Why do a deep dive into my, into my favorite Old Testament book today? Because Psalm 127 is about work. Written, as, as perhaps you noticed, by Solomon. And Ecclesiastes is a book written by this same man who did it all. Who scaled the heights of the human experience. Denied himself no pleasure. A man who had the means to fulfill his every fantasy. Solomon could try out a new and different whim every day of his life. And it didn't satisfy. I praise God that Job and Ecclesiastes are in the canon of Scripture so that I don't have to wonder the rest of my life about what would happen to me if I lost it all or if I lived a life denying myself no pleasure, buying whatever I wanted. Those pictures have already been painted for us. So join me as we first look at Ecclesiastes uh, and then uh, explore biblical perspective on work and folding it all together with Psalm 127. Kohalat, the teacher, describes for us how he understands all of his efforts. The book begins with a short introduction in verse 1, and then he, he launches into a forceful speech on work and toil. Verses 2 through 11. Meaningless, meaningless, says the teacher. Utterly meaningless. Everything is meaningless. What do people gain from all their labors at which they toil under the sun? Generations come and generations go, but the earth remains forever. The sun rises and the sun sets and hurries back to where it rises. The wind blows to the south and turns to the north. Round and round it goes and uh, ever returning on its course. All streams flow into the sea, yet the sea is never full. To the place that the streams come from, there they return again. All things are wearisome, more than one can say. The eye never has its enough of seeing, nor the ear its fill of hearing. What has been will be again. What has been done will be done again. There is nothing new under the sun. Is there anything of which one can say, look, there is something new. It was here already, long ago. It was here before our time. No one remembers the former generations. And even those yet to come will not be remembered by those who follow them. Maybe not the sweetest book to read right before bedtime, right? Um, verse 2 is the single most ridiculous sentence that I'm aware of in Hebrew. Uh, I want to put it up on the screen for you. Uh, this is what it says. Hebel hebelim amar kohalet. Hebel hebelim hakol habel. We have a sentence where five of the eight words are forms of the word hebel. Five of the eight are one word. Uh, your Bible might translate this different ways. It might uh, say meaningless. It might say vanity. Um, Hebel is a very important word to understand here. It, it dominates the introduction to this book. It's a theme throughout. This term has been translated uh, by a ver uh, in various ways by different translators from the traditional vanity to more recent translations. Crenshaw translates it futility. Fox uh, absurdity, longman, meaningless. What's interesting about this term, Hebel, is that you've actually seen it before. Uh, you probably just didn't know it. We see the word Hebel first appear in Genesis chapter 4, right after the fall. It was a man's name. You might know him as Abel. Hebel, the Abel. The term occurs nowhere else in the ancient world as a personal name. It's the only Abel that existed at that time. It appears to describe the nature of Abel's life as fleeting. He was killed by his brother Cain, and therefore he left no descendants and so had no lasting significance for future generations. The word Abel occurs elsewhere in Pentateuch, in the Pentateuch, the first five books of the Bible, only in Deuteronomy 32 where it refers to the images that are worshipped in place of God, Deuteronomy 32, 21. 
They made me jealous by what is no God and angered me with their worthless behebelim uh, idols. In the book of Proverbs, the word hebel is used to describe money and beauty. In many cases where hebel is used, what is described as hebel looks good to the human eye. It looks like a shortcut. It looks promising. It looks life-giving and fulfilling, but ultimately it, is, it leaves a person feeling unsatisfied. So I want to argue that Hebel does not translate well enough to just be meaningless. If you do even a basic reading of the book of Ecclesiastes, you would see that the author does not believe that everything is meaningless. On the contrary, the author is going to recommend certain ways of living, precisely because there is a way for human beings to experience joy and goodness in existence. Everything is not meaningless. Instead, verse 2, the author is stressing a point. Hebel is ephemeral. It's temporary. It does not last. It's like a vapor or a breeze. There is, there is much to life that is fleeting and temporary and that has no lasting impact. Consider these passages. Psalm 39, 5. You have made my days a mere handbreadth. The span of my years is nothing before you. Everything is but a breath, Hebel, even those who seem secure. Psalm 144, 4. They are like a breath, Hebel. Their days are like a fleeting shadow. Proverbs 31, 30. Charm is deceptive and beauty is fleeting, Hebel. But a woman who fears the Lord is to be praised. Translated the same way, Ecclesiastes chapter 1 verse 2 would read like this. The merest of breaths, says Kohlet. The merest of breaths. Everything is but a breath. But it isn't just the temporary nature of reality that Ecclesiastes has in mind and is warning us about. Ecclesiastes warns us that our pursuits, our successes, our longings... They're elusive. Even if you get your hands around something that you value, there are no guarantees. This life is like a vapor, a mist that you cannot take control or take hold of. Psalm 39, 6 and verse 11 tells us, Surely everyone goes around like a mere phantom. In vain, in, in Habel, they rush about, heaping up wealth without knowing whose it will finally be. When you rebuke and discipline anyone for their sin, you consume their wealth like a moth. Surely everyone is but a breath. Hebel. We get a glimpse of this idea that we as humans have about as much of an effect on reality as a phantom trying to exert a force on a physical object. That to try to gain for ourselves something that God has not willed to happen is futile, is useless is a chasing after the wind. Before COVID, Chantel and I were in a a small group uh, going through the book With by Sky Jathani. It's it's a favorite of mine. Uh, It describes the various ways that we try to relate to God and ultimately how many of us try to to, uh, exert some sort of control over God. The book leads us to the conclusion that we really can't control much of anything. I can control, you know, like what brand of toilet paper I buy or what basketball team I root for. But that's about it. I was fascinated because in both small groups that I was in, there was significant pushback on the thought that ultimately life is out of our control. I I think I can control more than that, was the sentiment that I got from both groups that I was in. And then in something of an ironic twist, we entered into COVID season, where I could not control even the brand of toilet paper that I was buying. (laughs) And I could not control what team I was rooting for because they weren't playing the games. By my effort, what I do, I cannot control outcomes. I cannot guarantee anything about tomorrow. James is actually explicit about this. I find this to be one of the more compelling passages in Scripture. Now listen, James writes, you who say today or tomorrow we will go to this or that city and spend a year there, carry on business and make money, why you do not even know what will happen tomorrow. What is your life? 
You are a mist that appears for a little while and then vanishes. Instead, you ought to say, if it is the Lord's will, and only if it is the Lord's will, we will live and do this or that. Now, this is our language. This is how we talk. These are the sorts of ideas that have been integrated into our thinking. It is Christian to do and do and do. It is Christian to save the world. It is Christian to carry the weight of that world. Jathani writes, somewhere in our spiritual formation, we were taught either explicitly or implicitly that what matters most is not God's love for us, but how much we can accomplish for him. Phil Vischer, who some of you may know as the creator of Veggie Tales, uh, Christian's children videos were Christian children's videos where stories from the Bible are acted out by various squash, cucumbers, <laughs> asparagi, things like this. Uh, Phil Vischer has, has spoken about how he grew up idolizing those within the Christian community that were enterprising and effective, the Rockefellers of the Christian world. This led him to believe that impact was everything. He later reflected on his understanding of work after he lost his company in 2003. Fisher wrote, The more I dove into scripture, the more I realized that I had been deluded. I had grown up drinking a dangerous cocktail, a mix of the gospel, the Protestant work ethic, and the American dream. The savior I was following, in hindsight, was equal parts Jesus, Ben Franklin, and Henry Ford. My eternal value was rooted in what I could accomplish. Christian author David Platt argues that many of us have come to believe that our greatest asset is our own ability. Let that hit you a little bit this morning. I am not, I am not blameless here. So let's read Psalm 127 again, this time from the message translation and see what it has to contribute to the conversation on work. Peterson writes in his translation, if God doesn't build the house, the builders only build shacks. If God doesn't guard the city, the night watchmen might as well sleep, might, might as well nap. It's useless to rise early and go to bed late and to work your worried fingers to the bone. Don't you know he enjoys giving rest to those he loves? Don't you see that children are God's best gift? The fruit of the womb, his generous legacy? Like a warrior's fistful of arrows are the children of a vigorous youth. Oh, how blessed are you, parents, with your quivers full of children. Your enemies don't stand a chance against you. You'll sweep them right off your doorstep. What is success? What makes for a successful family, a successful church, a successful life? Is it truly your effort? Because if we're going to be a church that believes that success is contingent on our effort, then we will be compelled to work harder and harder, and we will tighten the screws down on every individual and family. But if God doesn't build the house, if God doesn't guard the city, our efforts come to nothing. Psalm 127 goes as far to, as to assert that Unless God is part of our work, or to say it even better, unless we are a part of God's work, our efforts are completely in vain. Let me give you three quick notes from the New Testament to build on this. John 15, 5, Jesus says plainly, I am the vine, you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit, but apart from me, you can do nothing. In our own hubris and from our own beliefs about self-reliance, we may come to believe that we are, in fact, the vine uh, and that all life springs from. Jesus corrects us plainly. He does not say, apart from me, you will only have limited success. He says, apart from me, you can do nothing. Matthew 21 through 16 is the parable of the workers in the vineyard. I think it's one of the more perplexing parables that Jesus ever tells. 
He tells of an owner of a vineyard who goes out to try to hire some workers to come and work in his vineyard that day. The owner goes to, to go to, to find workers early in the morning, and then he goes out for, for more workers, kind of strangely, at 9 o'clock in the morning. And then he goes again at noon, and then at 3, and then even at 5 o'clock in the afternoon, he still goes out and he hires more workers to bring into the vineyard. This is not how we hire workers. This is not the way I do things. Which tells me that perhaps the owner of the vineyard is not most concerned with the work but with being with his workers, bringing them into his vineyard. Maybe there's something more going on here. Luke 15, the parable of the prodigal son. We know about the prodigal son. You've heard that story forever. He asks his father for his inheritance and completely wastes it. He comes home to his father with an excuse that he's been rehearsing ready to to apologize to his father, to beg, to please take me back, even as one of your servants. I just, anything would be better than what I've been experiencing. But he never gets a chance to tell his excuse. His father runs to him and embraces him. We don't talk about the older son much, the older brother. He never left his father's house. He never stopped working in the fields. His obedience seemed permanent. But when his long-lost brother comes home, he had no sympathy, no desire to go and welcome his brother. It's like he knew nothing of his father's heart. He did all the work. But the work was not what his father wanted from him. He wanted to be with his sons, to know and to be known by them. Unless God builds the house, unless God guards the city, Our efforts are hebel. They are ephemeral. They are temporary, a vapor or a mist. He is in control. Do we trust where he leads? Can we trust him enough to join him in his work and to acknowledge that unless we're truly with him, it's for naught? You may be wondering, uh, what is the deal with the second half of this psalm? Uh, Why is there this whole section on children? Um, seems really, you know, entirely unrelated. Uh, I was wondering about that too, to be honest. Commentators Dennis Tucker and Jamie Grant really helped me out here, um, painting a picture to me that made it perfectly clear. As a reminder of God's work in the world, the psalmist refers to children in the second half of Psalm 127. If ever humans could look at something and declare, we made that, surely that would be the case with children. And yet the psalmist confesses that even children are from the Lord. That they are from him, verse 3. In some way that we cannot fully explain, God has invited human beings into his creative work to be with him. Remember God giving Adam work to do in the garden? This seems to be the sort of thing God does. He has allowed the branches to experience something that the vine already knows. And so there's no room left for arrogance or feelings that we can control everything. Even our children are from him. All of it should give way to humility. You know, let, me have, let, let me allow Peterson to have the word, last word on this psalm. Psalm 127 shows a way to work that is neither sure activity nor pure passivity. It doesn't glorify work as such, and it doesn't condemn work as such. It doesn't say, God has a great work for you to do. Go and do it. Nor does it say, God has done everything. Go fishing. How do we navigate this? How do we navigate this? How do we find this middle road? Life is not all about what I do. It's not. That's not, that's not the story. God is the one who does. Read Psalm 23. It's God taking every single action. Everything I do is just a response to that. I encourage you to consider all of this as we prepare our hearts for the table. Would you pray with me? Father God, what is success? 
What is a good family? How do we get there? How do we build the right church? Lord God, help us to see that that, uh, on our own efforts, Lord, we, we come up short every time. Help us, Lord, to be people that do more than just strike off on a, on a pioneering mission and, and ask you, God, after the fact to bless what we have decided to do. Help us, Lord God, to be the sorts of people that look to you and say, what, Lord, do you have for us this day, this moment, this hour? Help us, Lord, to consider what you have for us and then live a life in response to that. And Lord, as we prepare our hearts for the table, help us to consider again this cross, this symbol of Christianity, this symbol that has become the most recognizable on this planet. Would you help us to more resemble your son that died on that cross for the sins of a world, people that did not know him, people that did not love him, people that would never receive him. He had love in his eyes for them, Lord. Help us, Lord God, to never, ever step out of the shadow of that cross. To never think, Lord, that we are are, are too good for someone. To never think, Lord, that your love, that that they don't deserve what you have given us in the gospel. Help us, Lord, to live a life that is more sacrificial, that looks more like Jesus, that calls us to humility again and again and again. Thank you, Lord, that you show us a true and a right perspective on work. Your longing, your heart's desire is to be with us, to partner with us, to show us your way. Help us, Lord God, to consider all these things. In your name we pray.